So I recently read about this article um, about a, some kind of correlation. Well, it was a claim of a correlation between general intelligence and compression capabilities, which definitely triggered the bullshit alert uh, signal. <laughs> and uh, um, Because essentially there have been researchers who actually claim that indeed a model that can compress, you know, the way, for example, uh, FLAC or PNG compressors work, you know, if we can do that with an artificial intelligence, then it means that, you know, we are close to general intelligence because, you know, the idea is that if something can compress the world, it means that, you know, it knows what the world is. It can reason about the world and so we can compress it. But that, of course, is a big bullshit <laughs> because we should all be familiar with something that is called Shannon's Source Coding Theorem, which I'm going to be explaining in this episode. This is Data Science at Home Podcast, and I'm Frag, podcasting from uh, Brussels City, Belgium. Welcome to the show. So the theorem I'm referring to is the Shannon's Source Coding Theorem, and that's uh, a fundamental result in information theory. Of course, I'm not going to go through the details of what information theory is about, um, but it, in fact, you know, long story short, it tells a, it's, it's a theorem that tells us about the, let's say, the limits of how much we can compress data without losing information. That's a very important thing that we consider compression, so-called lossless compression, which means compression that doesn't lose quality. So you can perfectly reconstruct the signal, the original signal, be it an image or be it a sound, um, you know, without, uh, fr from the compressed version back to the original, and you can go back and forth as many times as you want, you will not lose any information, which means that you will not lose quality. For, you know, MP3, for example, you lose quality, okay? So you can compress, I think, about uh, 10 times the original size. Uh, JPEG, you lose quality, but PNG, you don't. FLAC, you don't. It's some form of encoding um, for which you can reconstruct things. Now, back to Shannon, uh, which is the very important finding of, like, what is 60 years ago or more? <laughs> um, no, maybe less. Um, actually, more. <laughs> anyway. Um, it's all about entropy as a lower bound. So, Mr. Shannon said, he said a lot of things. There is a beautiful episode on this show all about Shannon. Just search, I will report the reference in the show, in the, in the show notes of this episode. And of course, you know, on the official website, datasciencesathome.com, but also on the official, we have a YouTube channel now, so we can use that. <laughs> and so you will find... Um, the reference to that, uh, the link to, to that episode, which I find extremely interesting because, well, I'm, I'm biased. I'm biased. I, I just love Shannon because he did a lot of things. Anyway, the concept of the entropy, right? Entropy is usually defined, well, represented with the symbol H, H of X. So a X is the random variable and H is the entropy of that random variable. What does it, this all mean? Well, that's, uh, as Shannon said, that's the theoretical limit of, uh, let's say, how much a source can be compressed, right? So the lower bound for lossless compression, so if you don't want to lose quality, is given by the entropy of the signal, the entropy of the source. In other words, you cannot compress data, again, in a lossless way, below its entropy, right? If you try to do that, you would lose information. Okay, the second concept is the indeed lossless compression. As we said, you can perfectly re reconstruct everything back, fine. And then we have the limit of compression. So according to this theorem, and there is a proof, okay, a mathematical proof. You cannot break that. If you break that, you disprove the theorem, which means that a lot of you know a bunch of other things will be broken, like thermodynamics probably. <laughs> um, so it says that. For a data source with entropy H, H of X, the average number of bits needed to encode a symbol from the source can never be less than, guess what, H, right? So this means that any compression algorithm that achieves this is considered optimal. You cannot, you cannot go below that. So if the entropy of a source is two bits per symbol, which means that you need two bits to represent 
any symbol in the dictionary. You cannot compress it to fewer than two bits per symbol on average, if you don't want to lose information, of course. So now, why can you uh, can you uh, can't you compress? You cannot compress below this threshold. Well, the entropy h in fact represents the minimum average number of bits needed to represent the symbol at the source. And I want to stress on this. You cannot, it's like speaking a language with less words that the language allows you. You will, you might be losing information in, in, in a way because you, there might be things that you cannot express because you don't have enough words. It's a decent analogy, hopefully, <laughs> to the, the concept of a lossless compression. Now, Imagine a file that contains, or, or a signal, right, a, a, a source or whatever, um, that contains the same character repeated 10 times, right? Um, so, for example, a, 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 10 times, or 100 times. Now, this file, as you know, is highly redundant, you know, because there is just one symbol repeated 100 times, right? This means that you can compress it a lot. And so this means that um, you can represent that string of 100 A's with a very compact representation. For example, I have one uh, which is um, symbol A and the number 100, for example. That indicates the number of times you should be repeating that symbol in order to reconstruct the original uh, sentence or phrase. And so that would be A, 1, 0, 0. So four symbols instead of 100 times A. Uh, and so that's a compression. I believe that there are way better, uh, better ways to compress 100 days, but, uh, you know, just for the sake of explaining this. But if you want to compress, for example, something like A, G, D, F, L, K, blah, 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 whatever, that is a kind of a, a random sequence of, um, of letters, or definitely more random than 100 days, this means that that source has higher entropy and there is less redundancy to exploit, which means that it cannot be compressed that much. Okay. Well, the first ones had uh, the, the first one, uh, you know, the under days had a very low entropy, right, or a lower entropy. So Shannon's theorem shows the fundamental trade-off between compressibility. Is, it, is that even a word? Hopefully so. <laughs> you you get what I what I what I what I need to 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 represent here compressibility, whatever, and the amount of information or randomness in the data okay that's what shannon's theorem that's the, the, the correlation between the two and that's expressed by the shannon's theorem now what does this research say well this research that i just read about um you know they speak about the chinchilla 70b model a large language model that we know we have presented a number of times on this show as well i think more than a year ago when we were starting speaking about large language models and they claim that chinchilla 70b can outperform traditional compression algorithms such as pngs and flac so it can compress better than png and flac which you know makes sense kind of i mean it can it can but there you know you have to tell the story entirely you have to tell the full story you cannot just claim like uh, large language models are, are better at uh, at compressing stuff because they are super smart or intelligent because they know the world. That's not the case, you know, right? And there are reasons, and those are the reasons that I'm going to explain in this in this episode. Now, th these results, if you look at the paper, it's like results are amazing, um, and there are valid reasons to challenge the you know the broader interpretation of what this means for general intelligence or even the practicality of such methods in real world applications now one step back to large language models we know that large language models are trained on you know massive data sets that include a variety of patterns uh, they include redundancies structures in natural language images audio and so on and so forth now this training which is usually massive allows the model to identify all the underlying regularities in the data, which, of course, can be leveraged to compress information because what a compressor wants to find or to see is indeed regularity because these are the things that you can compress the most. Remember, the 100 A's 
we could compress it a lot up to um, four symbols down to four symbols because there is a lot of repetition there is a lot of redundancy and so that's exactly what large language models would be used you know for to to detect these redundancies to find them and compress them and uh, uh, the challenge is that traditional compression algorithms like PNG and FLAC are engineered specifically for images and audio, any image, any audio, any type of sound. It can be music, it can be vocal. They compress always in the same way. And they often rely on human-crafted rules right, uh, to encode these redundancies. For image, it could be, for example, pixel values or sound patterns for sound and so on. While large language models might discover you know, more complex and more abstract patterns in, in the data because they have this ability to handle sequences and probabilistic structures learned during training, but this comes at a massive cost, which is the cost of computational resources and scalability, which PNG and FLAC usually are unbeatable at. And this is the story that they are not telling you. So large language models are not necessarily optimized for efficiency, and usually they are not. We are talking about 70 billion parameter models, after all. And so they will never be optimized for efficiency in compression, which could limit the, definitely the practicality in real-world scenarios. Imagine you had um, you know, your Photoshop or your GIMP, for those who use GIMP, and when you have to export your, your work, you, you just go you know, export as PNG, and instead of having like a bunch of kilobyte executable that does that 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 stuff for you, you know the the, uh, the compression and exporting the file, you have to run a massive large language model, a seventy billion parameter model, to export a, a you know a trivial image into a PNG. Uh, that would be definitely un unfeasible. Well, you can do it, but you know you need a, a nice GPU, you need a super powerful CPU. And a lot of energy to, you know, just export something to PNG. It is better, is it? I don't think so. Uh, is it better in terms of compression? Maybe, but I will tell you why. Now, large language models like Chinchilla, but we can generalize to other, other models for sure. These are generative models that predict sequences based on probability distributions over tokens. Okay, we have, we have said this a number of times on this show. There's no magic, there's no general intelligence, there's no biological brain, there's nothing. There's just, you know, a, a probability distribution over tokens, words, image patches, audio samples, whatever you want. The act of predicting the next token with a high degree of certainty suggests the presence of redundancy in the data, and also in the model, by the way. And in, in compression, redundancy is exactly what we want in order to reduce the file. The, the, the size of the file. I mean. Now, while large language models can model probabilistic structures very well, traditional algorithms like PNG and FLAC are optimized to find redundancies at, let's say, a much lower computational cost, like a fraction of that computational cost that large language models would need. Um, and, you know, we all know this, right? Try to run your own large language model and let me know, you know, this stuff spits something like I don't know, five to ten tokens per second on a good day. Uh, and on a very powerful machine, by the way, that is absorbing, I don't know how many hundreds of watts, you know, in order to do that. So uh, another thing that happens is that, uh, well, it's all about overfitting. So large language models are trained on a broad range of data, okay? And these data can be very diverse. It can be images, text, audio, whatever. So this amount of data usually allows them to recognize general structures across different domains. So you can uh, generate, for example, images of the desert as well as image of the sea, of mountains, or of human faces, or, or animals and cats. Cats are nice to, to generate. They have a lot of legs. <laughs> uh, so you, you get the point, right? Now, this capability, in fact, can be a problem and can be a potential you know, weakness for these models because uh, the performance of large language models in compression, in fact, 
could be very domain specific, right? So Chinchilla 70B may compress well on data sets like ImageNet or LibreSpeech because those are, you know, the types of data that contain structures that are similar to what the model has seen during training. They can generalize to some extent, but you know, if you might if you move to a completely different domain or type of data or type of images to compress, it might very well be that the 70 billion parameter model will not be performing as good as it was performing on, let's say, similar images or similar sounds, right? And so this means that you have to keep retraining or fine-tuning. That's why GPT is, is fine-tuned overnight. Uh, Chat GPT as well. I mean, every lar large language model, you know, these are things that need to be fine-tuned over and over again. And so if Shinchila needs retraining or fine-tuning for each new type of data, uh, you know, you understand that this could, you know, <laughs> reduce the, general the generality of the compression capabilities. And we don't even want to start with, the, you know, resources, energy, and, and, and the like. So these are all things that you would need in order to generalize across data types. So I think this is the full story that they should have told that claim you cannot just have a clickbait that says you know compression capabilities equal general intelligence that's not fair right that's surfing the hype that's contaminating the world with stupid information oh my god i'm gonna get angry again <laughs> anyway the idea that you know good compression may indicate let's say a step forward and toward general intelligence it, it's something it's not new okay it stems from the belief and again it's a belief that efficient compression reflects a deep understanding of the structure of data and in theory a model that can let's say perfectly compress any type of data would have to possess some form of general knowledge about the world that's the speculation that these people are are, are making but you know, that's a speculation. You cannot make a claim out of this. So, you know, compression can be definitely a useful metric, uh, but may not directly correlate with, let's say, general intelligence, not even intelligence, I would say. Compressing data efficiently doesn't, you know, imply understanding in the human sense. It, it, if you can compress a concept, okay, humans can do that. It's called synthesis. But if you have an algorithm that can, can, that can compress something, it, you know, the fact that the algorithm can compress doesn't make it intelligent. So I don't see how that would be applicable to large language models just because they are big. It does make sense. Uh, compression, the only thing that compression does is focusing on eliminating redundancies. Well, intelligence requires problem-solving, reasoning, and ability to generalize across different domains. I mean, there are so many things that intelligence entails and, and requires that, you know, goes definitely beyond finding redundancies. This is an, an entropy problem. It's nothing more than that. So, yeah, okay, large language models are excellent at compressing without advancing toward general intelligence. I'm sorry. Sorry to disappoint you people. So if you want to ask the question to someone at the bar tonight, can data be compressed to uh, sizes smaller than Shannon data compression limit? That's going to be a nice night at the bar. If you start speaking about these things, please, please tell me. <laughs> I want to know which bar did you go? <laughs> the short answer to that is no. You cannot compress to size smaller than Shannon data compression limit. And, I mean, you can, but um, that will be a lossy compression, okay? You cannot go behind, you know, below that. Shannon showed you, you, you cannot compress below the limit without losing information. That's what Shannon said a long time ago. You cannot break that. If you find someone in any conversation that says that with thanks to large language models, they broke that, they are shitting you, believe me. All right. All right, folks, that's a wrap for today's episode of uh, Data Science at Home podcast. And, uh, well, if you have managed to stay awake through all the algorithm talk, 
congratulations. <laughs> Remember, in the world of AI, anything is possible. Just stay away from charlatans or the charlatans. There are more and more these days. And uh, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And uh, hey, join us on Discord. Of course, I mean, do I also have a Discord channel? So it's good to chat. And uh, this is Frax signing off from uh, Data Science at Home. Now go and compress something. <laughs> or, you know, take a nap, whatever works. See you next time.